Hello, Cape Physics Unit 1 students. We'll be working through a specimen paper one that CXE provided us with. So this is CXE specimen paper one from June 2017, okay? So we'll just be working through this paper right now. Um, just some instructions that you guys know already. Um, the test has 45 items on it. You will have an hour and a half to answer all of them. So that gives you roughly two minutes per question, okay? So budget your time accordingly. So now we're gonna go through the solutions. Again, you have your list of physical constants on the second page. So always refer back when you want something. And so moving to question one. So question one says, which of the following pairs of units are SI base units, right? So the base units are the things, are the units from which we get our derived units. And so the base units cannot be broken down any further, right? Into any other base units because they are the base, right? So if we look at this, ampere is a base unit, but Newton isn't, right? Newton is what? Force is equal to MA, so that can be broken down further. And we look at B, we see Kelvin, that's a base unit, and we see ampere, that's also a base unit. So the pair of units would be B. So our answer for one is B, right? All these other ones are derived units, but these are the base, so one is B. All right, so moving on to item two. Item two refers to the following two vectors. We have a vector P and we have a vector Q. So they're asking which of the vector triangles show the correct resultant R is equal to Q plus P, right? Now to get the resultant um, vector triangle, let's draw, let's redraw Q here. So this is Q going this direction. And then if I add that to my P, I'm gonna start P here and have P going in this direction. And then to get my resultant, right, I'm gonna draw a line from where I began with Q here to the end of P. So that would have me going in this direction. And then of course, that's the direction of my resultant force, right? So this would be R equal Q plus P, right? So I'm starting from my beginning for Q and then going to the end of P. And this is the triangle I come up with. So let's look among the answers, which one matches that. This one doesn't match. This one doesn't match. So here's our match here. C is our answer for two, okay? All right, so moving along to C, to, to question three now. Item three refers to the following figure, which shows the displacement of a particle and how that varies with time. So we have a displacement, time curve, time graph here. And so we know that this is a region where we have a negative gradient, so a negative gradient would imply what? A negative velocity, right? Because that's distance over time and the gradient of that so that the change in S over time is gonna be our velocity, right? So they're asking us to see which of the following graphs represent the dependence of velocity with time. So we want to get a velocity time graph from this information up here. So as I said, this very first section, we have a negative slope, right? A negative constant slope, a negative gradient. So our velocity here will be negative velocity and it will be constant, right? And then in this region, we have positive velocity, constant as well. And then here again, we're gonna go negative, right? And then negative velocity. And then here we're gonna go positive velocity. And then again here, a negative slope indicates a negative velocity. So let's go down here now and see if anything matches that. This one, we're starting with a positive velocity, so we know that that one is incorrect. This one is also positive, so this one is incorrect, right? So let's see what C looks like. C looks like we have a negative velocity here, constant velocity here for the first part, so that's good. And then we have our positive, we flip to positive, and then negative again, and then positive, and then negative. So this could work. So let's see what D is, and then we compare and see which one we're gonna come up with. So when we look at C and we look at D, the difference that we see here is that this one has a, what, what is this? This is a um, less negative velocity. This one is a less negative velocity. This has a more negative velocity. So let's write that here. This is more negative. V and then this one has a more positive V, so that's closer to zero, right? Positive V, and then here up here we have a more positive 
velocity because you see that that's higher and then here we have this one is not as positive right compared to this one so less less positive than the other one that we're comparing it to right so when we look at our actual graph we can see that as it relates to our value of the negative velocity compared to our positive value for the velocity when we're in these regions we see that Comparatively speaking, we're going to have a region, we're going to have a graph where we have the, the positive velocity being much greater than the negative velocity, right? And so this is the one that captures that, right? More positive velocity and then a less negative um, velocity down here. So this is our answer. So D is our answer, right? for question three, okay? So it's just analyzing the displacement time graph and seeing what kind of velocities you will get and then just translating that into a velocity time graph, okay? So that's the key to doing these kinds of analyses. So moving down to item four. So item four refers to the following diagram. So here we have a projectile motion. A stone is thrown from a building at X and it follows a parabolic path as shown in the diagram. The maximum height reached by the stone is P, so P is up here, and they're asking what the vertical component of acceleration of the stone will be, right? Is it the max? Is it maximum at P? No, that's not where the vertical component will be maximum. Will it be maximum at X? Um, no, that's not our answer that we're looking for. It will be the same both at X and P, and so that's actually true. So that's what we're looking for in this particular case. Our answer is C. Will it be zero at P? No, it won't. So this one won't work either, okay? So our answer here is C is that it's the same at X as it is at P, right? So moving on to question five, item five refers to the following diagram. So we see that we have a wooden block of mass, 0 0.8 kilograms, and that's being pulled along a rough horizontal surface with a force 20 newtons as shown. So we're pulling this wooden block with a force of 20 newtons this way. Um, and the block experience an, experiences an acceleration of five meters per second squared. What is the magnitude of the frictional force? So the key thing to remember here is that our F equal MA generally refers to the resultant force, right? So what we have to do is come up with a, a relationship between um, the resultant force that includes frictional energy, frictional force, right? So F minus frictional force is gonna be our, give us our resultant force, right? So this is our resultant force. So um, down here we have F, which is the force that it's being pulled along the surface with, minus the frictional force that would oppose the motion is equal to our resultant force, which is Ma, right? So if we are rearrange making the frictional force our subject, we'll end up with frictional force being equal to F minus Ma. And the F we know is that's being pulled in one direction is 20 Newtons. So that's the one that we put here. And then our Ma, Right, so they tell us what the velocity, the acceleration of the block is. They say it's five meters per second squared. So that's what's gonna result from the, the, the net effect, right? The, the resultant of the forces. So this is what we're pulling it along the surface with. This is the mass of the block and this is the acceleration. So what it's actually accelerating with, right? Um, once that resultant force is acting on it. And so when we do that, right, remember now we're rearranging to find our frictional force. And so when we do that, we get 20 minus four. And so we end up with 16 being our frictional force. Our answer for five is C. So the important thing to remember is that the MA, F equal MA, that's, that F is a resultant force. Right, And that resultant force in this particular case came from the force that we're pulling it with minus whatever the frictional force was that was acting on the surface. And that's what would, would be equivalent to our mass times acceleration. Right, So as long as you remember this relationship, you should be able to just solve a frictional force. That's what we did and we came up with 16 Newtons, okay? All right, so moving down to question six. So another one with parabolic motion. So we have... um. Item 6 refers to the following diagram, which shows a projectile fired with a horizontal velocity of V 
from the edge of a cliff, right? The height of the cliff is six meters. So this is our height of the cliff and we're firing off this projectile with a horizontal velocity of V, right? And we have our angle here, right? So we have our theta here. And so which of the following pairs of V and H will give the maximum value of theta? So here's our theta, right? So to find theta, what would we do? We're gonna do opposite over adjacent, right? So remember that this is a x, this is a horizontal velocity. So this is in our x axis, it's, it's in our x direction, right? So tan theta is gonna be opposite over adjacent. So it's gonna be h over v. And so ultimately to find theta, we're gonna do the inverse tan of h over v, right? And so if we want to get the maximum possible value of theta, we're going to want this ratio to be the greatest, right? The ratio of HV, the largest ratio of HV is what we're looking for here. So this is the ratio of H to V in this case would just be one over five, right? So that's not what we're looking for here. Um, and then in this case, it would be what? Five over three, right? Because 50 divided by three. And in this case, it would be one. And in this case, it would be five, right? So this, this combination of V and H is going to give us the maximum value of theta because theta is equal to the inverse tan of H over V. And if H over V is a large number, we're going to get the largest theta, right? That's the max value of theta. So this is D. So 6 is D, okay? So 6 is D. Moving along to question 7. So question 7 is one that's about conservation of momentum, right? So here we have a monkey of mass 20 kilogram. He's riding on a trolley, right? He's on a 40 gram trolley and he's moving. They're both moving together with a steady speed of eight meters per second, right? Along a flat surface. So in our initial case, what do we have? We have the monkey of mass 20 kilogram. The trolley is 40. So that's a total mass of 60. And they're moving with a speed of eight together, right? So our initial momentum, is it going to be 480, 60 times 8, so that's 480. And so they're saying, no, the monkey jumps off, right? The monkey jumps vertically to grab the overhanging branch of a tree. So the monkey jumps off the trolley now. So what's remaining now is just the mass of the trolley, which was 40. So in our final state, we have just the mass of the trolley and we have the velocity that that trolley is going to move off with by itself, right? So if they're asking us to find what the speed of the trolley will be, then we just say our momentum before is equal to our momentum after, right? This is mass times velocity again for momentum. And so before we had a momentum of 480, so then if we divide both sides by 40, we can isolate for velocity. And so we'll end up getting that our final velocity, our V2 is equal to 480 divided by 40, which is 12, right? So our answer here is 12. Again, this is just based on the principle of conservation of momentum. All right. So moving on to question eight. Question eight says the velocity of a body with kinetic energy EK and mass M is. All right. So we're finding velocity. Okay. So we start with the formula for kinetic energy that says EK is equal to half MV squared. Right. So what we want to know is just rearrange making V the subject. So we do that, we get V squared is equal to, we bring up the two, so we get two EK, and then we divide both sides by M, so we end up with two EK over M. And if we want to get V, we're gonna have to find the square root of all of this, and so we end up with square root of two EK over M. And it turns out that, that that's B, right? Among our answer selection, that's B. So B is our answer for eight. So all we have to do is just rearrange the formula for kinetic energy to solve for the um, velocity, okay? All right, so eight is B. Moving along to question nine now. So question nine is talking about a parachutist that's falling through air of uniform density from a great height, right? So the G is the acceleration of free fall. Which of the following graphs shows acceleration? How is acceleration vary with time, right? So remember now, acceleration is equal to what? The rate of change of velocity, right? So this guy is falling, he's falling through the air, right? Uniform density through that air and he's falling through. So when he's, he'll, he'll start off, right? When he starts falling, he'll be at 
a gravitational acceleration. That's the acceleration that he'll start to follow with. But as he goes down and down and down further, his velocity is changing and it's 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 gradual. It's changing in such a way until it gets to finally um gets to zero. And so our curve will actually look like this, right? So this is the curve that represents how that acceleration varies with time that captures that change in velocity over time to eventually hit zero, an acceleration of zero once he, once he ends up on the ground, okay? So this curve would capture that one. So let's move on to 10. So 10 says that two rocks are spun around in circular paths at the end of strings of equal length, right? So the strings have equal length and you have a rock in this case and a rock in this case and you're just spinning them around, right? So it's in circular motion. So what quantity must be same for both rocks if the tension in the strings are equal? So tension is equal to mv squared over r, right? So if they're telling us that the, the ends of the strings have equal length, we know that the radius that of that circle that they're being spun in is going to be equal. So what else must be true? So, so this top part must also be true, right? These, um, in the end, the kinetic energy would have to be true, would have to be the same for both of them, right? If the tension is supposed to be equal. So the mass doesn't have to be the same for both of the rocks. The velocity doesn't have to be the same for both of the rocks, but at the end of the day, the kinetic energy has to be the same, right? So that would be D here. All right, so moving along to 11. So moving along to 11, so if we have an airplane A that's traveling at twice the speed of airplane B, so we can say, okay, this is airplane A, this is airplane B. So airplane A is traveling at 2V and say B is traveling at V, right? Plane A is half the mass of airplane B. So, so let's say the mass of airplane A is M, and then the mass of airplane B is 2m, right? So now they're asking, which of the following statements is correct? Um, is it true that the two airplanes have to have the same kinetic energy? Well, let's calculate it and see. Kinetic energy is half mv squared. So we put half m times 2v squared in this one case, and we end up getting what? We end up getting... Um, 2mv squared for kinetic energy in this case. And then when we put um, half mv squared for this one, we're going to end up with just v squared, right? And so in that particular case, we can see that the two airplanes, they don't have the same kinetic energy. So that's not true. Um, what's actually true is that the airplane A has twice the kinetic energy of airplane B. And that's what we see from our calculation here, okay? So the answer here is B. So all we have to do is write down what they told us and then apply our formula for kinetic energy. And so we'll see that, that, that A is actually twice as much as B. So our answer is 11, for 11 is B. And so moving along to question, where are we, question 12. So question 12 says that an object is rotated in a vertical circle with an angular velocity as shown in the diagram below. So here we have our tension and we have our, our velocity here. Um, and so they're asking which of the following quantities remain constant as the object moves around its circular path. So when we're in circular motion, what's happening? Our tension is actually changing, right? The tension um, at the top is going to be different from the tension of the bottom. And the tension over here is also going to be different, right? So the tension changes depending on where um, the object is. So we know that the tension is not going to remain constant. So the acceleration of the object, that's actually a constant parameter when we're in circular motion. And the kinetic energy also is a, is a constant parameter. And so our answer for here will be C. So it's 2 and 3 only. So that's our answer there for 12. Um, and then now we are at 13. So 13 says that in a 100 meter race, the winner finished in a time of 9.90 seconds and the fourth place sprinter finished 12 milliseconds later. So in what time did he finish the race, the fourth sprinter? So we know what time the first guy came in. 
And they told us that the second guy came in, what, 0 0.012 seconds later, because that's 12 milliseconds, right? So we just add the two together to find out how much behind him, like what time did he actually come in, and that's 9.912 seconds. So we look for that among our answers, and that's A. So our answer is A. Okay, so 13A, and then 14 now. A geostationary satellite traces an orbit with an angular velocity omega s at a distance r above the Earth's surface. Which of the following quantities will be the same for both, both the satellite and the fixed point on the Earth's surface? So what will be the same? Um, the speed will be different. We know that. But the angular velocity omega S and the angular displacement will be um, the same for both of them, right? So two and three is our answer here. So C is our answer for 14. And then for 15 now, um, Marsha needs to find the mass of her dog, but he will not stay on the bathroom scale. So first she weighs herself. And then when she weighs herself, she gets this. She gets 47 plus or minus one kilogram. Then she stands on the balance with her dog. She's holding her dog now. And the reading becomes 64 plus or minus one kilogram. So from this reading, they're asking us to calculate the percentage uncertainty in the mass of the dog. So first you have to calculate the mass of the dog. And that's just the mass of Marsha and her dog minus the mass of Marsha by herself. So that would be 17, right? So 17 is the mass of the dog. And then in terms of the errors now, so when you subtract errors, they're gonna, you're gonna actually have the effect of them being added to each other effectively. So what we have is two kilograms for our errors, right? So we have a mass of, so we have for the dog, we have a mass of 17 plus or minus two kilograms, right? because these errors are effectively being added in this way. And so we end up with, if we're supposed to find a percentage error, we're gonna put our error over the actual mass of the dog that we calculated. So that's two over 17 times 100. And when we do that, we get 11.76, which is roughly 12%. So we find 12% in our answers and that's D. So that's our answer there, okay? So 15 is D. So just remember how error propagates if you're finding, if you have an error in one case and an error in another case, if you're adding the terms or if you're subtracting it, you're going to end up just adding the errors, right? That's the net effect is that you're adding the errors from both measurements. And so when you do that, you get two for your error plus or minus two kilograms. And then as a fraction of the value that you get for the mass of the dog from here, you find that percentage error turns out that it's 12. So 15 is D. And then we're moving down to 16 now. So 16 says, which of the following cannot be demonstrated in sound waves? So sound waves are longitudinal waves. So let's just drop that down here. Sound waves are longitudinal waves. So what, what property don't they have? They can be reflected. They can diffract. Um, they cannot be polarized, right? Because polarization means that you're limiting the vibrations to a single plane. And in longitudinal, you only have one plane. That's just this back and forth motion, parallel motion, back and forth. Back. So you can't polarize that, right? Because it's on, literally only one plane that you have to begin with. Um, they do interfere. So this one would be correct. Um, longitudinal waves do show interference, but polarization, you can't do that because you only have this back and forth motion. And polarization means that you're going to cut off one of the planes and leave the other as you can do in, in, in when you're working with electromagnetic waves or transverse waves, right? Because they have two components, right? So in, you can polarize transverse waves, but you can't polarize longitudinal waves, right? All right, so C is our answer here for 16. So moving along to 17 now. So 17 says, which of the following gives the correct relationship between the intensity and the amplitude of sound waves. So we know that the intensity of a sound wave is proportional to its amplitude squared. So we know this formula from memory, from our, from our knowledge of sound waves. So we're looking for I proportional to A squared down here. And so we look among our answers and we see that B is the one that matches that, right? So B is our answer here. And that's coming from our knowledge of intensity of sound waves, right? 
So 17 is B. So moving right along to question 18. So 18 says that the displacement time and displacement distance graphs for a transverse wave are shown below. So here's our displacement time and here's our displacement distance, right? So they tell us if we can get different kinds of information from those different um, graphs. So let's see what they're asking us. They're asking us to calculate the wave speed, wave speed, right? So we know the wave equation is C is equal to F lambda, right? So we're gonna have to use these, the combination of these to figure out what the frequency of this particular transverse wave is and what the wavelength of that particular transverse wave is, right? So let's start with our displacement time graph. From our displacement time graph, we'll be able to figure out a period and subsequently a frequency of, that, of this wave, right? So let's look at this now. So the time that it takes for one complete oscillation, so that's one crest and one trough, in this figure is 20 seconds, right? So one oscillation takes us 20 seconds, so that's our period. And then to find our frequency, we'll just do one over our period and we end up getting 0 0.05 hertz, right? So we have our frequency down, so that's good. We have one of our variables that we need. Um, and then for lambda now, we're gonna use the displacement distance graph to get lambda. And lambda is just one, is just one wavelength, so it's a distance between two successive points in the wave. So let's let's pick this point here and this point here as our two successive points that are in phase. And the distance between these two points is then what? That's 10, right? So 10 meters is our wavelength. And so we have our wavelength now. So we're gonna plug in 0 0.05 for frequency. And we're gonna plug in what? 10 meters for our wavelength or lambda, which we got from here. So when we do that and multiply those two to get our speed, we end up with a speed of 0 0.5, right? So we end up with a speed of 0 0.5 meters per second. We look among our answers, we see that that's B. So our answer here is B, right? So this question is really testing your ability to use these, these, these graphs to come up with an answer, okay? So 18 is B. Um, so we're moving along to 19 now. Question 19 is up here. Um, this one is about refraction. So it says that for light passing through air to a material X, the refractive index is 1.3. So let's write what the refractive index of air is actually. Air is refractive index of air is one. The refractive index as it goes from, mat from air to material X. So the refractive index of material X would be 1.3, right? And then for light passing from air to material Y, would be 1.5. So the refractive index of material Y is 1.5, right? So the refractive index of Y is 1.5. The refractive index of X is 1.3. And we know the refractive index of air is one, right? So they're asking us now, which of the following shows the speed of light in air, X and Y in descending order of magnitude? So we're going from fastest speed to slowest speed, right? No. We know that speed, the light travels fastest in the less, the less dense medium. The more dense the medium is that you're going, it's gonna slow down the, 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 the light, right? So it's gonna go like this, right? It's gonna be fastest in air, because this has the lowest refractive index, right? Then once you go in here, it's gonna, it's gonna slow down even more in X because that's a more dense medium. And then why it's gonna really slow down some more, right? So in order of descending magnitude, it would be air, X, and then Y. And that all of that information we got from our refractive indices, okay? Remember, more dense medium, if you're in a more dense medium, you're gonna slow down. Less dense medium, you're gonna be really fast. So it's fastest in here, then slow down in X, then slow down even more in Y. So this is our descending order of magnitude of speed, okay? So our answer for 19 is A. All right, so moving down to question 20. Question 20 says that light from a source is incident normally on a diffraction grating, which has 2,000 2, lines per millimeter, right? What is the wavelength of the light if the first order maximum, so that's our N in this case, first order maximum makes an angle of 30 degrees with the zero order. So between the zero order and the first order, so we're at N, right? Um, that's our nth uh, maxima. So 
let's see now. So we're supposed to calculate a wavelength. And so we know we can pull for this equation, right? Which relates the um separation of the slits to the um the 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 angle theta and the actual wavelength, right? So then we want to solve for wavelength. So we do lambda is equal to d sine theta over n. And so to calculate d, we're gonna actually have to um divide. So in per one millimeter, there are 2000 lines, right? So we do one millimeter divided by 2000 lines and that's gonna give us our d, right? Which is just a separation of the, um of the slits. So 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 that's D there that we calculated here. And so we did then now we, we know that the theta is 30. So we can plug in 30 here, sine 30. So that's five times 10 to negative seven sine 30. And we know that N is one because it's just our first order maximum. And so when we do that, we come out with a lambda being equal to 2.5 times 10 to negative seven meters or 250 nanometers for our lambda. And so that's just B here, okay? So this question is testing your ability to recall and use this formula here, which is specific for diffraction grating. Um, um, and so, yeah, so we can use that to calculate our lambda. And that's what we did in this case, right? So moving down to 21. So 21 says we have a converging lens and it has a focal length. So that's our F, a focal length F um, of, 12 centimeters. If an object is placed 20 centimeters from the lens, right? So that's our object distance. What would be the image distance, right? The image distance would be what? So to do this, we can apply the lens formula, which says that one over U plus one over V is equal to one over F, right? And so if F is 12, we can plug in 12 here. And then the object distance is U is 20. So we can plug that in here and just rearrange for V, right? We want to make one over V our subject. So we do one over 12 minus one over 20. And then when we do that, we're gonna come out with V being equal to 30 centimeters. So we look among our answers for 30 and it turns out that that's D. Okay, so 21 is D, just applying the lens formula here. So for 22 now, it says that the value of, of a possible wavelength for the radiation in the visible region in the electromagnetic spectrum is, so we know that in the visible spectrum or the, in the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum, we're on the order of nanometers. So like 500 nanometers would be a typical wavelength that we would have in the visible region. But we see here, they're not having the, the wavelength being nanometers. So we have to convert our nanometers to meters and that would end up being five times 10 to negative seven meters, right? So that's how I arrived at B for my answer in this one. Okay, so this is just relying on you being able to recall what the wavelength is in that visible region and then finding it among these here. And the easiest way for me to do that was to think, okay, if we have say like a green light, that would be 500 nanometers. So let me convert that to meters and then I end up getting five times 10 to negative seven, okay? So that's our answer here for 22B. All right, so moving down to 23 now. So for 23, we have two wave sources, X and Y, and they're positioned as shown in this figure, right? Um, From a point P, right? So this is our one source, this is our other source, it's it's from P here. Um, The two sources produce waves which are in phase, right? Which both have wavelengths of 20 millimeters, right? So this is a, some kind of an interference that's gonna go on here. And so they're asking us to calculate the phase difference or so that angle, between the waves arriving at P. So the waves, they both have wavelengths 20 millimeters, right? So when they arrive at P, will they arrive with an, an odd number path length or will they arrive with an even number path length? And that will determine the phase difference that we see, right? And so they're arriving out of phase because they have an odd number phase, um, they have an odd number of their path difference when we look at this. So this one is what? The wavelength is 20, so this whole thing would end up being what? Six lambdas, right? And then this one would end up being what? Um, This would be 2.5, right guys? 2.5 lambda. So we don't have even number wavelengths, so we're gonna be out of phase when, we, when they arrive at P, and out of phase would be 180 degrees. 
So our answer here is going to be C, right? So 23 is C, all right? So that's because they're out of phase when they arrive at P because they have odd number wavelengths, right? All right, so coming down to 24, so 24 says that the magnitude of the threshold of hearing at one kilohertz is normally on the order of 10 to the negative 12 for a threshold of hearing. So these are answer here. So threshold of hearing is around 10 to the negative 12 watts per meter squared. So this is our answer, okay? These are answer here. And this is just like kind of like a recall kind of thing, right? There's no real way of calculating it from just this information. It's just recalling that it's on the order of 10 to the negative 12 watts per meter squared. Okay, so let's move on to 25. 25 says, so which of the following is not a condition necessary for the formation of a stationary wave from two progressive waves? So essentially what we, what we want then, right? From these two progressive waves, if we're gonna form a stationary wave, what we want ultimately is destructive interference of those two progressive waves, right? So we want those two progressive waves to have destructive interference so that in the end, they'll cancel out and we'll get the stationary wave, right? So what we want to find down below are conditions that provide destructive interference, right? So, um, and then we'll find which one doesn't provide that, right? So destructive interference, we need superposition. So we need the waves to be superimposed. So we need this, right? Progressive waves must be traveling opposite direction. We need this for destructive interference as well. Progressive waves must be of the same amplitude and frequency. Yes, we do need this if they're gonna fully cancel. And then finally, they're saying, do we need the distance between the sources of progressive waves to be whole number wavelengths? Because guys, remember now, you know, we want destructive interference. If there are whole number wavelengths, the two waves that we're putting together are whole number wavelengths apart, then that's going to be constructive, right? Remember, constructive interference occurs when we have whole number wavelengths, destructive when we have odd numbers. So we don't want this because this would be constructive and not destructive. And if we want to form stationary waves, we need destructive interference of these two progressive waves. So these are answer here. These are not required. We don't want this because if we have this, we're not going to make stationary waves. We're going to we're gonna bolster our progressive waves and form an even bigger progressive wave, right? That's not what we want. So these are answer here. We don't want that. All right, so 25 is D. And so moving down to 26, 26 says that a glass of effective length, 0 0.6 meter, a glass tube rather, of effective length 0 0.60 meters is closed at one end, one end, right? Given that the speed of sound in air is 300 um, meters per second, the two lowest resonant frequencies are, all right, so to approach this one now, we're finding resonant frequencies. And so say I have my tube here, right? So I have an opening tube closed at this end and the length is 0 0.6 meters, right? Speed of sound is 300 um, meters per second in air. One way that we can approach this is to say, okay, B is equal to F lambda, right? And so frequency, because we want to find a resonant frequency, we can, so frequency will be V over lambda. So ultimately, because the, um, what should I say? So we can just pull out the lambda here and say, okay, really and truly what's happening is that the frequency is proportional to one over lambda, right? Now, when we talk about resonant frequencies, right? And we have, an, an open tube, an opening tube like that, we have different lengths where we have the first resonance, right? And then we can have our second resonance, at, it's at a different length. So generally the first, the length for the first resonance, right, is lambda over four. And then the second resonance will be three quarter lambda, three quarter, three quarter lambda, right? And so because we have that, that can effectively also give us our uh, relationship with frequency, right? So essentially what we're seeing here is that our, our two lowest frequencies will be in this particular proportion, right? So if I look at my answers, I should pick um, two frequencies that show that in the one case, um, this frequency is a third of the other. Right, so the lowest frequency could potentially be so the 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 lower of the two 
is going to be a third of the second one. So I look at my answers here and I see which ones are have a factor of three between them. And so it's not this one. Um, and in fact, it's not this one either. Uh, let's see which one. Well, actually it's B, because B 125 times three gives us 375. So our answer here is B, right? So essentially what I'm doing is I'm using these equations that we know for resonance that says that the, at the first resonance, L is gonna be equal to lambda over four. And then the second one happens when um, lambda is equal to three, three lambda over four. So then by extension, that's what the, that's the relationship of the frequencies as well using this relationship, right? So when I use that relationship, I see that um, my one of my resonances, the way that they're related is they're a factor of three apart from each other. And so this is the only one that shows that kind of relationship. So my answer for 26 is B, okay? Um, so let's move along to question 37. 27, or how that's 27 says that we have a microwave transmitter here and we have a point P here and a point Y here. And it's saying that a microwave transmitter X sends radio waves to a metal sheet Y, right? So this is going to this metal sheet Y. Um, a probe P between X and Y is moved from one node through 20 antinodes to a node 0 0.3 meters away. What is the frequency of the microwaves emitted from X, right? So now we're talking about nodes and antinodes. And so you have to remember that a wavelength, right? What a wavelength is, is gonna be um, two times D, where distance a, where D is the distance between two nodes, a node to node distance, right? So if I have a node, I can have a node, let's say we're moving from one node through 20 antinodes and then finally to another node, and the distance between the node and the final node is 0 0.3 meters, right? So in order to find my distance between two nodes, I'm gonna have to do this number here, 0 0.3 divided by 20, since there are 20 antinodes in between it. So that means that there are also 20, a total of 20 nodes there. And so when I come down here, I do lambda is equal to that 0 0.3 divided by 20. So that would be my D, right? And then I multiply that by two, and so I get lambda. So it turns out that lambda in this case ends up being 0 0.03, right? Because as we said, lambda is equal to two times D, and we said D was 0 0.3 divided by 20, right? Because there are 20 antinodes there. So lambda ended up being 0 0.03, right? So now I have to find frequency. So I use my, my um, wave equation, which tells me that frequency is equal to the speed, right? Which is that microwave is moving over lambda. We know that microwave is an electromagnetic wave, so it's going to be moving with a speed of 3 times 10 to the 8. I divide that by my wavelength that I calculated to be 0 0.03, and then I get a frequency of 1 times 10 to the 10 hertz, and that's D. All right, so 27 is D. Okay? So moving down to 28 now. 28 says, which of the following quantities does not remain constant when particles move in a simple harmonic motion? So we know that when we have simple harmonic motions, we have oscillations, we have a mass that oscillates, um, that's in a, that follows the oscillatory path, right? So it's oscillating. And then what else do we know? It's oscillating about a fixed position. So there's a fixed position there. Um, and there's a max amplitude that that reaches as well. Um, so when we have, when we're in simple harmonic motion, what's changing then is our force, right? So the force is gonna change, it's not gonna be constant. So right away, we can select A for 28, okay? So that's just remembering some key things about simple harmonic motion, that the, that the mass is oscillating, the mass is constantly oscillating. Um, it's at a fixed point when, it re when the mass is in equilibrium, and then there's a restoring force that returns it to the equilibrium position if it's displaced. So that force is gonna be changing, okay? It's not gonna be constant. So 28 is A. Moving along to 29 now, 29, all right. So 29 here we have uh, a mass attached to a spring here. So mass is attached to a vertical helical spring and displaced at a distance A. 
from equilibrium I showed in the diagram. So A is going to be our amplitude, right? Maximum displacement. So that's our amplitude. And then the mass is released so that it oscillates with simple harmonic motion with angular frequency of omega, right? So when we, when we see this kind of question now, we have to think of our harmonic, our harmonic motion formulas, right? So they're asking us which of the following expressions give the variation of velocity with time, right? So because they're talking about displacement here, we can find the one that re relates um the displacement at a point to the peak displacement, and that's x is equal to a sine omega t, right? So we have to remember now immediately what velocity is. Velocity is the rate of change of your displacement, right? So that's delta x, really over delta t is what we're trying to find here. And so in this particular case, so we can do a differential. So it's a differential of the equation that represents your displacement with time. And so when we do that, so come down here, I did that that's, that's what v is, right? v is our rate of change of displacement. So I'm essentially just differentiating this equation. And when I do that, of course, I'm gonna bring out my, um, my angular frequency. And so I end up with V is equal to A omega sine omega T. So this is what I get from that differentiation. Again, the velocity is the rate of change of, of um, displacement. So if I find a differentiation, if I differentiate this equation, I should get velocity. And that's what I did here. And I ended up with a V is equal to A omega sine omega T. And that answer is actually C. Right, so that's my velocity. So I'm starting from my displacement and then differentiating that to get velocity. So 29 is C. And so now we're gonna do 30, moving down to 30. So 30 says that a mass M undergoes horizontal, simple harmonic motion under the action of two springs that are shown here, right? Its equation of motion is given by minus 2 km over x and its amplitude is a, right? What is, it, what is its maximum kinetic energy? So right now we know we're going to have to use the kinetic energy equation on some level. So we say ek is equal to half mv squared, right? Now what we don't know right off the bat is what v squared, what our v squared term is going to be, right? So we have to find that first of all. Right? So they gave us this equation of motion, and this actually looks like an acceleration, right? So we're going to say negative 2kx over m is just our acceleration of this mass. And so acceleration is equal to minus 2kx. So we're going to compare that to the acceleration for a body that's in simple harmonic motion. And that's just that a is equal to minus omega squared x, right? So in this particular case, if we compare this one, this equation to our general case for harmonic motion, we'll see that this term here, so this first part minus 2k over m is actually omega squared, right? Minus omega squared. So minus omega squared is equal to minus 2k over m. So that's what we get here. And then we can find omega by finding the square root of both sides. So it turns out that omega is equal to the square root of 2k over m, right? Now, the reason why we want to go this route of finding omega is because we know this relationship, right? So this third equation here, this third relationship, we know that the velocity of a body that's in simple harmonic motion can be calculated by doing the um, angular frequency, right? The angular frequency times the square root of the maximum. So the maximum displacement, so this is our amplitude squared minus x squared. Now, in this particular case, uh, we know that x squared is going to be zero. And so just a regular x squared is going to be zero. And then the x naught squared is actually a, right? Because it told us that the amplitude is a. And remember, amplitude is our, max, is our maximum displacement. So we can put a squared here. So what we end up with is when we plug in omega is equal to the square root of 2k over m, we plug that in here and then multiply that by our amplitude squared, we're gonna get square root of amplitude squared here, right? And this is just nothing more than square root of a squared is a, and in this part we keep as 2k over m square root, right? So now we have an expression for v, which is what we wanted all along. And so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take this um, velocity 
and we're going to plug it in up here. And so when we do that, we get EK is equal to half M. This is what we had from before. And then now the V now is going to be square root of 2K over M times amplitude and then square that whole thing because it's a velocity squared, right? So when we do that, we're going to get EK is equal to half M. And then how the working out of this inside part happens is that we just remove the square term from this. So we end up with 2K over M. And then we're going to square our square amplitude, and so we get amplitude squared. Now, this mass is going to cancel this mass, and this 2 is going to cancel this 2, right? And so we end up with Ka squared. So the expression for Ek is going to be equal to Ka squared. So we look among our answer now, and we see that that's D. So our answer for this one, for 30, is D, right? So that's just us knowing what the formula for kinetic energy is, knowing how we can relate this equation of motion to, to, what, to what we can, to what we have in um, simple harmonic motion, which is A is equal to omega squared. And then we can go from there once we use this third equation, which relates um, velocity, linear velocity, to our angular frequency, okay? All right, so that was question 30. Um, and so now we're moving on to question 31. So question 31 says that one fixed point on the thermodynamic temperature scale is identified by what? Is it the ice point or water? Nope. Steam point? No. What is a triple point, right? So the triple point on the thermodynamic temperature scale um, is a fixed point that we can identify, right? So we have that, so 31 is C. So moving along to 32 now, two bodies, when they're in thermal equilibrium, what will they have the same? So thermal means heat, right? And so if something is in thermal equilibrium, that means that they both have the same amount of thermal energy. And the way that we can measure thermal energy is through the temperature, right? The temperature of those bodies. So those two bodies will have the exact same temperature because they have the exact same thermal energy, right? And so that will be B. So our answer for 32 is B. And so moving along to 33, 33 says that the temperature of 50, of 50 grams of liquid was raised by 60 Kelvin when it was used to cool a steel ball of mass 100 grams from 150 degrees C to 70 degrees C. If the specific heat capacity of steel is 450 joule per, kel per kilogram per Kelvin, what is the specific heat capacity of the liquid, right? So we want to find the specific heat capacity of the liquid. We know the specific heat capacity of steel is this, so that the specific capacity of steel, we know what the mass of steel is. So the mass of the steel is 100 gram. Let me put it in kilograms since our specific heats are in kilogram. So that would be what? 0 0.1 kilogram, that's the mass of the steel. The mass of the liquid is going to be, put it that in kilograms too, so that would be 0 0.05, right? 0 0.050 0 kilograms, right? So essentially what's happening now, what we have to realize is that there's going to be conservation of heat energy, right? So whatever whatever was used to cool the steel ball so that it's going to go to raising eventually be transferred to the raising the temperature of the liquid right so we have q is equal to mc delta t as our formula for specific heat capacity when we have a temperature change we're going to use this one right q is equal to mc delta t so for the steel the q the actual energy right that was that was used to cool that down would be 0 0.1 kilograms times the specific capacity times the temperature change, which was what, from, from 150 degrees C to 70 degrees C. So we put that, so that's 80 Kelvin, right? It's the same, whether it's in whether it's in Celsius or Kelvin, the temperature difference will be the same. So we can just put 80 here, but just know that that's in Kelvin, right? And so when we do that, we end up getting 3,600 joules, right? So that's the amount of energy that it took to cool down the steel. And so that same energy is, what, is what's going to be coming from the liquid, right? So um, that liquid here um, is going to be MC delta T again, right? So heat specific capacity is going to be the mass of the liquid 
times the temperature change, which is 60 Kelvin, that's what the temperature change by in this case. And then um, the specific capacity, we don't know. We're trying to find that, right? CL. So again, M, C, delta T, Cs are unknown that we're trying to find. We know that the heat energy is going from one body to the next. So this 3,600 that we got up here, we can use it here. And so when we rearrange making C the subject, we're going to end up doing 3,600 divided by 0 0.5 times 60, which is 3. So we end up getting that the specific capacity of our liquid is 1,200 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. And so that's A, right? And the reason why we're able to do this kind of analysis is just realizing that the energy is within that system and it's just being transferred from the steel to the liquid, right? So we cool down the steel, the temperature of the liquid rises. And so the heat is being transferred from one to another. So it's the same amount of heat content that would apply to finding the specific capacity of one of the bodies, right? Which in this case was our liquid. And so we do that, we get 33 to be A, which is 1200 Joule per kilogram per Kelvin. Okay, so that's 33. So moving along to 34. So 34 refers to the following diagram. So we see that we have this brick wall that has a 10 meter length, four meter height, and then the, the thickness would be 210 millimeters, right? So they're saying, um, if this brick wall is insulated with a material of thermal conductivity 0 0.70 watts per meter per Kelvin, um, if the insulating material is 210 meters thick, the interface between the wall and the material is at 95 degrees C and the rate of heat flow into the interface is 4 kilowatts, what is the temperature on the other end of the insulation, right? So when we talk about thermal conductivity, this formula immediately comes to mind, which says that the thermal conductivity times the area multiplied by the change in temperature over length is equal to Q over T. And this Q over T is that rate, right? That's that rate of heat flow that they gave us. So this is the rate of heat flow. Q over T is the rate of heat flow. So we have a formula that can relate all of the variables that they gave us. So this is our thermal conductivity. We can find the area. And then we know this because they gave us that. We know length because they gave us the length to be 10, right? And so we have our theta one minus theta two here. We want to find a temperature, one of the temperatures because they gave us one of them. And so we rearrange making the temperature difference our subject. So to do that, we end up with theta one minus theta two is equal to the rate of heat flow, which is Q over T times the length divided by minus K over A. And when we do this, right, and plug in all these values, we come up with 65 being our um, temperature on the other end of the insulation, right? So we just have to use this formula for thermal conductivities and arrange to make our unknown the subject so we can plug in the values and find what the answer is for that value, okay? So that's 65 here, so that's D434. And so 35 says, what is the SI base unit for specific heat capacity? So we know that specific capacity is normally given as joules per kilogram per Kelvin, right? So when we do this, the only thing that's not currently in a base unit is the joule, because Kelvin is a base unit and um, kilogram is a base unit, right? Base unit for mass and temperature. But joules is not. Joules is a derived unit, and so we have to simplify it into its base units. So we can just do joules would be work, right? So that would be force times distance. And we know that force is kilogram meters per second squared. Those are its base units. And the base units of distance is meters, right? So all we have to do now is just plug in this where we had joule. And so we have kilogram meters per second times meters divided by kilogram Kelvin, right? So we can cancel these two kilograms. And then what we're left with is just meter squared. So M times M meter squared, second to the minus two over Kelvin. So our answer here, we look for this in our answers and that will be D.
right? So all we have to do is just break down this derived unit into its, into its bases, base units, and then we'll come up with an answer because they want the answer to be only in base units for specific heat capacity, okay? So our answer here is D. All right, so 34, no, 34 say, what is the average kinetic energy of helium atoms at 27 degrees C? So if we want to find the average kinetic energy of these mono of this monoatomic gas, really, um, we're gonna have to use average kinetic energy is equal to three over two times both Boltzmann constant times temperature, right? And so we do, we end up plugging in everything. We're gonna convert the temperature to Kelvin first, right? So we convert that to Kelvin. And so we end up with the temperature being 300 K. So we just plug that in here. So we have three over two. We have our um, Boltzmann constant, which is 1.3 times 10, 3A times 10 to negative 23. And we have our temperature of 300. So we plug everything in and we come up with an average kinetic energy of 6.21 times 10 to negative one joules, right? So our answer here is C, okay? So all we're doing is using this equation that we know for um, monoatomic gases. And so this is what we use and we get um, 6.2 times 10 to negative 21 joules. So moving down to 37, 37 says, which of the following is not an assumption of the kinetic theory of gases? So in the kinetic theory of gases, is it true that a gas consists of a large number of molecules? That's true. Is it true that the gas molecules are in constant random motion? Yes, that's true. Is it true that the gas molecules collide inelastically with each other? No, that's not true, right? The gas molecules collide elastically and so we're able to have conservation of energy, right? It's not inelastically. So this is not true. Is it true though that the duration of a collision is negligible when compared to the time interval between collisions? Yes, that's true too. So the thing that's not true here is an, is an inaccurate assumption is this one, right? The gas molecules collide inelastically. No, they don't, they collide elastically, okay? So 37 is C. And so we're moving down to 38. So 38 says that we have a monoatomic gas at 18 degrees Celsius and 1.25 times 10 to the 5 Pascal is contained in a vessel of capacity, one cubic meter. So our volume then is one meter cube. Our pressure is 1.2 times 10 to the 5 and our temperature is 18 degrees C. I'm gonna convert that to Kelvin, that would just be 291 Kelvin, right? So to find the number of atoms present, we're gonna have to use um, this ideal gas equation that says PV is equal to NRT, right? So we're gonna solve for N, which is just the number of moles, right? So we do, we plug in all of these values that we know, we plug in pressure, volume, the universal gas constant R, we use 8.31, and then um, temperature is 291, and so we come out with number of moles of 49, right? So the final step now is we know the number of moles of the gas. In order to get the number of atoms, we have to multiply the number of moles times Avogadro's number, which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23, and we end up coming out with, um, what do we come up with here again? So we came out with, B being our answer. So we came up with three times 10 to the 25, right? When we multiply these two. So that's our answer for 38 there, right? So again, we're just using the ideal gas equation, but the key thing is to remember that you have to multiply your moles by Avogadro's number since they're asking about the number of atoms, right? So yeah, so we come up with B. So our answer is B for 38. So we're moving along to 39 now. Item 39 refers to the following PV diagram. So it's a pressure and a volume diagram, which represents a gas being taken through three processes, right? So we have one to two, right? Where, we, where that's pretty much a compression. And then two to three is a compression as well. Um, the, pressure is, the pressure is constant, but the volume is being decreased. So we have a compression here. And then finally, so let, write, let me write that. One to two is compression. We're compressing the gas, so we're decreasing the volume. And then here we're also compressing it again, right? We're decreasing the volume of the gas. 
And then in this final stage from three to one, we are actually expanding. So the gas is expanding, right? The volume is increasing. All right. So now the question is asking us in which, in which of the processes is work being done on the gas, right? So if we're doing work on the gas, we are compressing the gas. If work is being done by the gas, the gas is expanding, right? The gas is expanding if work is being done by it. But if work is being done on it, we are compressing it, right? And so they're asking which processes on the graph represents work being done on the gas. So those are compression steps. And so these are those are these two, from one to two and then two to three, okay? So we look at more answers from one to two and two to three. That's where it being done on the gas. We're compressing it. So our answer is A. So 39 is A. And we're moving right along to question 40. So 40 says, um, an ideal gas is initially a two meter cube. So it's initially here. And it's initially at a pressure of two times 10 to the five. So this is where we're starting. This is our starting point, right? And so... It's taken through a cycle as shown here. So we're gonna go up to A times 10 to the five, same volume, then we're gonna come across, we're gonna expand, the gas is gonna expand to the volume of 10 meter cube. And then now it's gonna, um, the pressure is gonna drop down to two times 10 to the fifth, right back where we started from a temperature standpoint. And then we're gonna come back across down. So we're gonna compress the gas back to two meters cube, a volume of two meters cube, right? So the work being done on the gas, so remember we said work being done on the gas, if work, be, if work is being done on it is a compression that we're doing, right? Compression we're doing, right? So the work being done on the gas in the cycle is what? So we're gonna have to calculate that. So in this case where we didn't change volume, there's no work being done here. We didn't change volume here, no work being done. The work is being done up here. Um, this in this case is being done by the gas is expanding. And so that work is gonna be um negative. So we do pressure, which is eight times 10 to the five times the volume change, which is 10 minus eight. So that's eight. And we end up with negative 6.4 megajoules, right? So this one is negative 6.4 megajoules. And then down here we have well, we have our pressure being two times 10 to the fifth, and we have our volume change being eight as well as we go from here to here, right? So that's a compression. Um, and so we have that being 1.6 times 10 to the six joules. And so we're gonna have to sum together both of these, right? These works. And so we, we're gonna add negative 6.4 to 1.4, and we come out with negative 4.8 megajoules for the work done on the gas in the complete cycle. Right? So that is C. So 40 is C here, okay? Again, just remember um, the formula for work on work being done on a gas is delta W is equal to the pressure times the change in volume, right? If we don't change the volume, there's no work going on. The work is zero. So it's zero in, on this side and it's zero on this side. It's negative up here and it's positive down here. And so when we sum the two together, we get negative 4.8 megajoules, and that is C, right? So 40 C. So moving along now to 41. 41 says a cube of density X centimeters is submerged in a fluid of density rho at a depth height, at a depth age below the surface of the fluid as shown in the following diagram, right? So here's our surface. This curly line is our surface. So that curly line is our surface. And so we see that we have the, the, the cube at a depth of h, but the side of a cube is actually x, right? So this is the full length to get to the bottom of the cube, right? So they're saying, what is the pressure experienced by the bottom surface of the cube? So this surface here, what kind of pressure is that gonna feel, right? So we have to say, okay, pressure is equal to h rho g. That's our, that's our starting point for these kinds of analysis where we have something below a liquid, in a, you know, in a liquid, submerged in a liquid, right? So pressure is equal to h rho g. So if it were just the top surface, that we're, if we're concerned about the top surface, it would just be h, that's our distance. But because we're concerned about the bottom, this h, right, is actually gonna be h, is gonna be equal to h plus x. 
right? Because it's at the bottom that we're concerned about. So we do h plus x to get to the bottom. So that's our full depth or height. And then we're gonna have our rho g as usual, right? So this is the pressure that that the that the bottom surface of the cube will feel. So we look for this in our answers, and we see that that's d. So our answer for forty one is d. Okay. So moving right along to forty two. Forty two says a steel wire of length three meters and a uniform cross sectional area zero point one millimeters squared is used in an experiment to determine the Young's modulus of steel. The gradient of force ex of the force extension graph is obtained to be 6.7 times 10 to the third Newton per meters, right? So what is the Young modulus of steel? Now to calculate the Young's modulus, when we have a gradient from a graph, we can just do gradient times the length over the area is going to give us our Young modulus, right? So Young's modulus is equal to this here when we know it from when we when we're given a gradient, right? All right, so then all we have to do now is plug in the value for the gradient, which is 6.7 times 10 to the three, multiply that by the length, which is three meters. And of course, we're gonna have to convert our area to meter squared. So when we convert 0 0.1 millimeter squared to meter squared, it ends up being 10 to the negative seven meters squared. And so when we plug everything in and multiply through, we come up with our Young's modulus being equal to 2.01 times 10 to the 11 Pascals. So we look among our answers for that, and we see that it's the very first one, it's A, that's our Young's modulus, right? So just remember this relationship between Young's modulus and gradient. So once we know this, that, that the Young's modulus is gradient times the length over area, we'll be able to calculate it, okay? So this is A, 42 is A. And so moving along to 43 now, 43 says, which of the following equations is correct, right? Do we know what stress is? The equation for stress is not length over extension. It's actually force per area. That's how we define stress. It's a force per unit area. And we define strain as the extension per unit length, right? So if, if, if the equation isn't giving any of this, it's incorrect, right? So this is not correct because that's not what stress is. Strain is extension over length, as we said here. So we know that this is correct. We don't even have to move any further. Everything else, you're just trying to throw us off. This is incorrect, and this is incorrect, right? The only correct one is for strain here, which is extension over length, and so our answer is B for 43, right? So moving right along to 44, 44 says that the equation for the net rate of heat radiation between two bodies is given as, what is that? That's really Stefan's law that we're working with here, right? So Stefan's law says that the power is equal to um, sigma A E temperature raised to the four, right? So this is Stefan's constant. Um, and so, yeah, so so from here, we can find, we, we're supposed to find the relationship that matches this, right? If we have two bodies, right? We have P is equal to sigma A E T to the four. E is our emissivity. If it's for black bodies, the emissivity, the emissivity, the emissivity will be one, right? And so we'd end up with P is equal to sigma A, that surface area, times the temperature of, of one of the bodies to the four. So if there are two bodies now, it will be P is equal to the Stefan's constant would remain the same. The surface area is gonna be the same. <clears throat> and then what's gonna be different now is the temperature. So the temperature in the one case, first body, minus the temperature of the second body raised to the fourth, right? So if we have two bodies, this is how we would apply Stefan's law. And so we're going to look for this among our answers. And we see that that is D, right? So 44 is D. We're just using Stefan's law and then um, applying it to two bodies, right? That have a, So that there are going to be a temperature difference between those two bodies. So we just um, account for that here, right? T1 to the fourth minus T2 to the fourth. So 44 is D. Moving to our final answer, our final question, which is 45. So 45 refers to the following force extension graph for three different materials, X, Y, and Z, right? So we're looking at this force extension graph. We see that there's X, Y, and Z. Which of the following options correctly labels the graph? 
So we know that this is going to be a breaking point situation here. So this will be something that's brittle. X will be something that's brittle because we see that we approach a breaking point. So it's a brittle material. And then here now we see this curvy um shape that we get for the extension. So this means that this is something that's malleable, right? That we can pull into, uh, we can beat it into shape. So we can have, we get that, that characteristic curve um, for a malleable substance or a malleable material. So then here now we see that this is the characteristic curve, force extension curve for a polymeric material. That's a polymer that gives us that, that waviness there. Right, and so this is our polymer, this is a malleable material, and this is a brittle material. So let's look down here for the correct labels. And when we look, we see that that is C, right? This is brittle, this is malleable, and this is a polymer material. So our answer for 45 is C, right? So with that, we've come to the end of the solutions for the specimen paper from CAPE. Um, thank you for hanging out with me. Please like this video, please share it, please subscribe to the channel. And all the best in your exam and I will see you in the next video.